Hi there, I'm V.E. Schwab, author of a dozen books, including A Darker Shade of Magic and Vicious and This Savage Song and City of Ghosts. But tonight I get to talk to you about my upcoming novel, The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue. The novel follows a young woman in the early 1700s who is living the kind of life where uh, 20 years pass you by and you blink and it's just gone. And suddenly you're afraid that your whole life is going to follow suit. And so in a day of absolute desperation, she decides to summon one of the old gods and make a deal for her soul. And I'm so excited to talk to you about it tonight, but I'm also so excited to read you an excerpt from the book, one that's never been read, never been shown. And so I decided to read you the scene in which Addie tries to summon an old god. Show yourself, she orders but her own voice is sharp and brittle as a stick. Something brushes her shoulder, grazes her wrist, drapes itself around her like a lover. Adeline swallows, what are you? The shadow's touch withdraws. What am I? It asks, an edge of humor in that velvet tone. That depends on what you believe. The voice splits doubles, rattling through tree limbs and snaking over moss, folding over on itself until it is everywhere. So tell me, tell me, tell me, it echoes. Am I the devil, the devil, or the dark, dark, dark? Am I a monster, monster, or a god, god, god? Or the shadows in the woods begin to pull together, drawn like storm clouds. But the, when they settle, the edges are no longer wisps of smoke, but hard lines the shape of a man made firm by the light of the village lanterns at his back. Or am I this? The voice spills from a pair of perfect lips, a shadow revealing emerald eyes that dance below black brows, black hair that curls across his forehead, framing a face Adeline knows too well, one that she has conjured up a thousand times in pencil and charcoal and dream. It is the stranger, her stranger, she knows it is a trick, a shadow parading as a man, but the sight of him still robs her breath. The darkness looks down at his shape, seeing himself as if for the first time, and seems to approve. Ah, so the girl believes in something after all. Those green eyes lift. Well now, you have called me, and I have come. Never pray to the gods that answer after dark. Adeline knows, she knows, but this is the only one who answered, the only one who would help. Are you prepared to pay? Pay. The price. The ring. Adeline drops to her knees, scours the ground until she finds the leather cord and frees her father's ring from the soil. She holds it out to the god, its pale wood now stained with dirt, and he draws closer. He may look like flesh and blood, but he still moves like shadow. A single step, and he is there filling her vision, folding one hand around the ring and resting the other on Adeline's cheek. His thumb brushes the freckle beneath her eye, the edge of her stars. My dear, says the darkness, taking the ring, I do not deal in trinkets. The wooden band crumbles in his hand and falls away, nothing more than smoke. A strangled sound escapes her lips. It hurt enough to lose the ring, hurts more to see it wiped from the world like a smudge on skin. But if the ring is not enough, then what? Please, she says, I will give anything. The shadow's other hand still rests against her cheek. You assume I want anything, he says, lifting her chin. But I take only one coin. He leans closer still, green eyes impossibly bright, his voice soft as silk. The deals I make, I make for souls. Adeline's heart lurches in her chest. In her mind, she sees her mother on her knees in church speaking of God and heaven. Hears her father talking, telling stories of wishes and riddles. She thinks of Estelle, who believes in nothing but a tree over her bones. Who would say that a soul is nothing more than a seed returned to soil, though she's the one who warned against the dark. Adeline, says the darkness, her name sliding like silk between his teeth. I am here. Now tell me why. She has waited so long to be met, to be answered, to be asked, that at first the worlds fail her. I do not want to marry. She feels so small when she says it, 
Her whole life feels small, and she sees that judgment reflected in the god's gaze as if to say, is that all? And no, it is more than that. Of course it is more. I do not want to belong to someone else, she says with sudden vehemence. The words are a door flung wide, and now the rest pour out of her. I do not want to belong to anyone but myself. I want to be free, free to live and to find my own way, to love or to be alone, but at least it is my choice, and I am so tired of not having choices, so scared of the years wretching past beneath my feet. I do not want to die as I've lived, which is no life at all. I... The shadow cuts her off, impatient. What use is it to tell me what you do not want? His hand slides through her hair, comes to rest against the back of her neck, drawing her closer. Tell me instead what you want most. She looks up. I want a chance to live. I want to be free. She thinks of the years slipping by, blink, and half your life is gone. I want more time. He considers her those green eyes changing shade, now spring grass, now summer leaf. How long? Her mind spins, 50 years, 100, every number feels too small. Ah, says the darkness, reading her silence, you do not know. Again, the green eyes shift and darken. You ask for time without limit. You want freedom without rule. You want to be untethered. You want to live exactly as you please. Yes says Adeline, breathless with want, but the shadow's expression sours. His hand drops from her skin, and then he is no longer there, but leaning against a tree several strides away. I decline, he says. Adeline draws back as if struck. What? She has come this far, has given everything she has. She has made her choice. She cannot go back to that world, that life, that present and past without a future. You cannot decline, one dark brow lifts but there is no amusement in that face. I am not some genie bound to your whim, he pushes off the tree, nor am I some petty forest spirit content with granting favors for mortal trinkets. I am stronger than your god and older than your devil. I am the darkness between stars and the roots beneath the earth. I am promise and potential, and when it comes to playing games, I divine the rules, I set the pieces, and I choose one to play, and tonight I say no. That is as much as I can share with you. Um, I can't wait to talk to you guys more about this book that has been almost a decade in the making and is finally almost soon to be here. So if you're just joining us, or if you've been just, just caught part of that, that was <laughs> Victoria Schwab reading her new book. This is Inverse Happy Hour, an Instagram live show. Yeah. And now we're taking some questions. I'm just going to kick things off. I wanted to ask something a little more broad. Um, as someone who's written a lot of books, I think a lot of people now are, you know, stuck at home thinking like, now is my chance to write that book I have <laughs> in me. Yeah. What advice do you have for someone who is setting out to write their first book? Oh my goodness. So uh, everyone you ask will have different advice for this. My advice is perhaps controversial, aside from the fact that in the end, no matter what advice you hear, the only thing that works is whatever works for you. I'm an intense outliner. A lot of my friends don't outline at all. But if you're writing your first project, if you eat, because really starting is the easy part, finishing is the hard part. I make sure that I have an ending that I'm excited about. I look at a book as a meal and I want to make sure, you know, when you eat a good meal, the taste left in your mouth is the thing that you remember most. And, and I think when it comes to story, we behave the same way. When it comes to story, having a strong ending is so important as a reader, but as a writer, it's the thing that keeps us going on the hard days. So I have an ending in mind because on good days, I'm excited to get there. And on bad days, it will stop me from quitting because I know that it's just um, an amount of distance that needs to be covered. So for those who are trying to write their first thing or writing something under this lockdown, under quarantines, I would say like get an ending that you're excited about and then work toward it. I like that. Um, someone asked, what are you drinking? I know it's oh. scotch, but give us a... Uh, yeah, this is a Talisker Sky, so it's pretty Ooh. peaty. I drink my meat. Um, I like the aisles and the kind of like the very, very heavily peated scotches. So this is this is a, a, an easy evening. I'm not going to say that this bottle was like full recently, sure. but it's definitely like it's a quarantine. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, someone else asked, how do you relate to the, the main character of your book? Um, yeah, that's a great question. I don't really have avatars in my books. Like I don't have one character that I relate to and the others that I don't. I tend to put a piece of myself into each of my characters. What I will say is that there are three leads in The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue. There's Addie, who is essentially like me in my 20s and now I'm 32, but that idea of like you look down to tie your shoes and you look up and you feel like years have gone by without your notice and you don't know how you got there. So I think a lot of Addie's restlessness is something that I connect with, but also the other human character in the book, his name is Henry, as somebody that Addie meets 300 years into her journey. He is in many ways who I think I would have been if I hadn't found writing. Like I started writing when I was a teenager. I got my first book deal when I was 21. So I've been doing this for over a decade now. And I look at Henry's struggles and I think if I hadn't found writing, like he's somebody who isn't apathetic. He's interested in everything. He just doesn't want to pick because he feels like in picking, he's going to have to not choose a hundred other things. And that scares him too. And so I feel like I connect, I tend to place my, all of my anxieties and my neuroses into my characters. Interesting. Uh, someone else wants to know, based on your location, um, do you speak French? Are you from France? Um, so no, my family retired here. I'm, my mom is English and my dad's American. And so they retired here about six years ago. So I always say I understand French really well. I don't speak it really well because I can't really do immersion since I write in English. Mm. Um, it's more difficult for me, but I have a pretty good comprehension of French, but I get really nervous and then I lose all my vocabulary, which I think is true for anyone speaking a second language. Yeah, very true. Yeah. Uh, someone else wants to know, and before I do that, let me just, if anyone's coming in now, this is an interview with Victoria Schwab for Inverse Happy Hour. We're taking questions. Uh, you missed the reading, but we will publish it <laughs> online later, so you'll be able to hear it on YouTube. Someone wanted to know just more broadly, what, what was the inspiration for this book? Yeah, um, I started this book almost a decade ago, which is surreal to think of now. I was such a baby. Oh. I was living in an ex-prison warden's garden shed in Liverpool, which is a very weird story for another day, but I was so miserable in this garden shed that hmm. one of the other people living in this house would let me kind of tag along on her adventures. And she would essentially drop me places and I would be wandering for like seven to eight hours and then she would come and pick me back up. And so I was in the Lake District in Northern England and I was just having a wander and it, in a place called Ambleside, which until the electricity kicks in at dusk, you can imagine it's two, 300 years ago. It's a village that looks really uh, timeless. And I was having a walk and a wander and I was thinking about Peter Pan because it's one of my favorite stories and how intensely sad the ending of Peter Pan is and that Peter Pan begins to forget. And I was thinking about memory and time, which are kind of the two themes at the center of this book. And I was thinking, as sad as it is to forget, it's so much worse to be forgotten. Because the thing is, Addie's memory is flawless. She can remember every moment of her 300 years and nobody can remember her. And I was thinking about how lonely time becomes when you don't have the mirrors of other people held up to you. Oh, it's powerful. <laughs> it's so fascinating when you say something like, this book is something you've been thinking about for 10 years. Yeah. And you've, of course, written other books in between. Yeah, you... this will be my 18th book. Congratulations. <laughs> How do you juggle those ideas? How do you say, well, this one's not ready. Let me put that yes. one down for a minute and do something else. That's a really great question because I think people think of me as a fast writer because I have so many novels. But what it really is, is like I, I picture my brain as a six burner stove and I have one project on high heat. That's the thing I'm actively writing. And the other five burners all are on. They're just on a lower heat setting. I'm letting something mm. kind of steep. And so Addie was an idea that I kind of got the first ingredients for, put them on the stove 10 years ago. And then I, I knew I wasn't ready to write it. I wasn't ready because I didn't have the voice. I wasn't ready because I didn't have the ending. Like I say, the ending is this thing that I never start a book without. And 18 books in, my endings have never changed. Ever, I've rewritten books from scratch, but the endings have never changed. And so I just checked in with it every year or two. I would get another piece of it. But you know, I think some stories we're retelling in across our careers in different forms and other stories we feel like we really only get to tell once. And Addie for me was that book that I knew I was only get to write it once and I wanted to do it right. 
and I hit 30 <laughs> and and it became the last piece of the puzzle that I needed in so many ways this is a story about that cusp of adulthood where you feel like you're suddenly supposed to know what you're doing and you don't and you just feel intensely lost in your own life and scared of how fast it's going by. And I kind of had to hit that moment to have the last piece of the puzzle of the perspective for that. But I checked in every, every six months, I would say. Wow, I like the, the metaphor of the six burner stove is great. Yeah. I really like that. Um, here's a question from a reader. I want to read it word for word because it's pretty good. They said, Faith Flake 95 says, I find it so hard to fight the self-doubt within me. What do you do to fight this part in you? I assume you experience self-doubt. Yeah, I experience a lot of self-doubt. Anyone who follows me online knows that I'm, I'm actually pretty, pretty open about it. I think it's super important to kind of de-romanticize the creative process and talk about how whether or not you're working on your first project or your 20th, you know, we all struggle. And I think when we don't talk about the struggle, what happens is those who are struggling feel isolated in their struggle and they start to think of it as a qualitative measure like, oh, this person's successful and they're not struggling. So I must be struggling because I'm not good enough. And the truth is self-doubt doesn't go away. I think self-doubt is a signal that you're still pushing yourself and you're still trying hard. I never want to feel comfortable in that way. But honestly, I start just like cutting down all of my purse, all of my projects to the smallest bites possible. I think on, on bad days, it doesn't have to be good. It just has to be something like you can't fix a blank page. So how do I get something down on paper that I can work with, that I can make better? Maybe I only write for 10 minutes at a time. Maybe I only want to get five sentences. It's amazing when you take the wall down to a step, how mm. easier it is to get over. That's good advice too. Um, all right, another one, but first, just for anyone who's just tuning in, because people keep on popping in, uh, we've got Victoria Schwab here and we're talking about her newest book and just writing in general. And this is Inverse Happy Hour, an Instagram live show. So here's another question from Megan Hobbs. She says, what about characters? Do you have to like your characters? I think I get bored or lose interest because I don't believe in them. So this is really interesting because the likability of characters, specifically the likability of female characters, comes up a lot in craft discussions online. I do not think characters need to be likable. I think they need to be understandable. We never have to like a character, but we have to understand why they do what they do. We have to find them sympathetic in the most, like, a grounded sense of the world. We have to have sympathy for why they have their actions. So it's never what people do in the story. It's why they do it. We don't have to connect to the what, but we have to connect to the why, to the motive, to the kind of the guiding force. I read an entire series about villains. Like they're mm -hmm. all terrible people. There are no good people in the vicious and vengeful books. Like they're right. monsters, but we connect to a few of them in terms of the why they're acting. And so I think really working hard from a craft perspective to make sure that you don't have to like a character, but you have to like not liking them then. You have to like be mm. invested in them. Because I think the worst thing that can happen is when you're not invested in the characters. Yeah, I, I, that's a good point. Do you prefer villains or heroes? Villains, villains. absolutely. Good answer, good answer. Villains. Uh, here's another one from a reader. Do you recommend writing drunk and editing so famous <laughs> no. photo books? No. <laughs> I'm too much of a perfectionist. I get really, really nervous about, I would say drinking for me is a reward. I tend to, I, I, like, I like save that for the part where I can't turn my brain off after the day. So like sometimes I, I just like want to be able to like have a separation of church and state inside my head. Mm -hmm. Cool. Uh, all right, here's another one little more uh, simple. Uh, I still can't believe you don't drink Earl Grey, says Charlie of Castle. But how do you feel about Scottish English breakfast? Oh, I will drink anything that's a black tea that's not Earl Grey. I just think Earl Grey tastes like, like a grandmother's clothing steeped in warm water for multiple wow. days. It's just velvet on the tongue. It's terrible. I didn't realize this was like an ongoing uh, this is, personality. It's a, big thing. <laughs> it's a big thing. Apparently, I just people get extremely offended every time I talk about how awful it is, but I stand by it. <laughs> I mean, I, I love it, but I won't hold it against you. So okay. It's fine. More for you. Thank you. Um, all right. We're going to keep going. Uh, let me know if, you, I know it's late, so let me know if you get tired and you want to take no, you're welcome, call you're it, but we just got a lot of questions, so I figured we'd keep asking them. Um, again, this is Inverse Happy Hour. We're, we're here with Victoria Schwab, and we're going to keep asking questions about writing and life and anything else. Here we have Whimsy Queen asking, 
How do you deal with imposter syndrome as a writer? Um, I mean, I kind of think that goes in with self doubt as well. Yeah. I, I try to like, this is the weird thing about being a writer. It, you can write and not want to be an author, but if you want to be an author, you want to be like published and, and available for consumption, you kind of have to come to terms with your own feelings about inadequacy because some part of you has to believe that your story is worth being read. Like it's, it's a very, very weird headspace. You have to be narcissistic enough to think that mm. other people should read your work while also probably still believing that it's terrible because it, it, those, that's like the neuroses that we have as writers. So I think imposter syndrome is something you don't get rid of. It's just something you mitigate. Like write, I think at the heart of it, like write things that make you happy, write things that you want to read. And, and that helps a lot. That's good. Uh, here's another one about writing from Daphne or Daphne. Uh, how do you approach writing the dialogue for your character? Oh, that's a really great question. I think people think that you're supposed to write dialogue like from the beginning to the end, mm. but I write dialogue from the middle out. So I write dialogue from the crux of the conversation. Cause usually when you are having a conversation, you're trying to get towards a point. Like mm. most of the time we're trying to like, we each have our own motive for the conversation and our own thing that we want to get to. And so I try to figure out what each character is trying to get to. And mm. then I write outward from the like crux of the conversation. Wow, that's smart. I never thought of that. I like it. Here's another, everyone wants to know how you write. Um, here's <laughs> another one. The settings in your book are so vivid. How important is setting to you? Setting is my first character. Setting is the character that I figure out before everything else in a really weird backward sense. Um, mm. In that like, I write about outsiders mm -hmm. primarily. And so in order to understand outsiders, you have to understand insiders. In order to understand insiders, you have to understand the society and the world that they fit cleanly into. So for me, I need to understand the world in order to figure out the insiders and from there in order to figure out the outsiders. So I find setting to be kind of like the character we don't talk enough about. I like it. Settings, settings important. And sort of similar to that, someone wants to know how much research do you do when you're writing a book? It varies on the project. To be honest, the books I do the most research for is a children's series that I write oh. called City of Ghosts, which are set in, uh, first book is set in Edinburgh, second book is set in Paris, the third one set in New Orleans, and they're all against the backdrop of real ghost stories. So I oh. go and I spend time in all of those places and I learn the kind of ghost stories that have been recorded at various places. And so everything has to be set on a very real place and a very real culture and identity. And so those I do the most research for. Makes a lot of sense. Um, someone just said she is Ravenclaw, which I guess my question would be, assuming you're a Harry Potter fan, do you have- Yeah, a I'm a Slytherin. I'm Slytherin. a very, Ooh, very hardcore well, Slytherin. You did say you like the villain, so I guess that makes I sense. I do. And All ambition. Right. And ambition. Ravenclaws are ambitious, but anyway, we don't have to get into Harry Potter too much. <laughs> Um, let me just ask you a few questions that I've been asking everyone on Inverse Happy Hour, and then I'll let you go. I know it's really okay. late. Um, so first, is there anything that you've read or watched recently that you'd recommend for people as they look for things to keep them busy right now? Oh my goodness. Um, I've been reading and watching a lot of things. I will say that one of the shows on television, I don't usually get behind like a huge amount of network TV. I tend to be a lot on the streaming sites, but uh, there's a show called Prodigal Son which has Michael Sheen, who's one of my favorite actors, and he's essentially playing a, a serial killer. And it's about him and his relationship to his son, who is a criminal profiler. And it's just really kind of delightful and refreshing and taps into all of my favorite kind of like Hannibal, you know, feels from TV while just having some good acting. So it's kind of a surprise, the one I didn't expect mm. to love as much as I do. I mean, it sounds great. I, didn't, I actually haven't heard of that one, but Michael Sheen is great. Oh, he's Apple, amazing. So that sounds awesome. Amazing. Um, and one last question, a little more broad. What do you think is the, you know, the value or the power of fiction and fantasy, I guess, in particular, especially in a time like this? Well, I mean, fiction serves two purposes at all times, right? It serves escapism. It helps us get out of our world. And it serves as a mirror. It helps us see ourselves in our world. Mm -hmm. and it helps us see ourselves in a position of power that we might not feel we have right now, it, it, especially at a time when we can feel very helpless in our reality. 
fiction and particularly fantasy is quite literally a doorway out. And so I think that all forms of escapism right now, whether they be books, comics, TV shows, movies, anything, video games, I'm like the only person in the world who doesn't play Animal Crossing and I'm regretting it right now. Ooh, my entire so Twitter feed is just <laughs> Animal Crossing. Um, but yeah, these are, these are so valid. I think now more than ever, you know, we just want to find a way to either feel powerful or to forget that we're not. Hmm. This, this makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I do recommend Animal Crossing. I uh, know. It's so hard. <laughs> well, I hope you're having, I hope you're just staying safe in the cottage. Yeah. It sounds really nice. Thank you so much for joining us for Inverse Happy Hour. And Thank you for having me. Just tell us quickly, when uh, when does the book come out? I don't think I Yeah, asked. so The Invisible Life of Abby LaRue will be out this October. So who knows, who knows what the world will look like? Um, but hopefully, you know, I'll be able to go on tour and hopefully we'll have some semblance of connectivity with readers. But yeah. in the meantime, yeah. That's great. Thank you so much. And just cheers. Cheers. Thank you for having me. Thank you.